All right, guys, welcome to our 2011 March episode of Pirate 4x4 TV Live, which just so happens to be about a month after King of the Hammers, so we have a whole lot of King of the Hammers information for you this round. Hard to believe a month has already gone by. It seems like we're just on the lake bed. And, uh, you know, speaking of fun, Jesse, it was a great time. Thanks for joining us out there. Did you have a good time? It was a blast. You know, this was my third year out there, and I will have to say I was absolutely impressed about how big the race has gotten over the last few years amazing but it's always good to just to be out there and be around other people and hear the stories and the smiles and and how everybody's prepping for the race it's just it's awesome event Th that it is you know i just got off the phone with dave cole we've got a little breaking news he got out of his blm post-race meeting with the blm and thumbs up to everybody fans racers spectators we've got an a plus marks it looks like the race is going to happen again february 10th 2012 we will have another king of the hammers yay Thank you so much to all of you. I mean, not only the people who put on the race, but I mean, my goodness, for everybody looking out for each other and staying safe, thank you so much because that means we get another year to play. Well, it was it was all eyes, literally from Washington, D.C., all the bureaucrats, everybody watching what we were doing. You guys did a great job. Race is going to happen again. Very excited for that. Okay, well, speaking of the race, we have the top three podium finishers. So we have Jason Shear, who came in third. We have Tony Pellegrino in-house, who came in second, as well as... Our very own king, your very own king, Shannon Campbell himself. We're going to sit down with each of them individually, and then at the end of the show, we're going to do a little round table. So you guys send in your questions. We'll put them all together. We'll see if we can get the sparks to fly. Send in your questions to the chat, and, uh, well, we'll see what they have to say. <laughs> Hopefully it'll ruffle some feathers, but maybe it'll just be a good conversation. A little pirate style. Yeah. Um, you guys, what, about a week, week and a half ago, you yeah. guys went out to Reno, and they did a shop tour of Torchmate at awesome video it's very cool to see the difference like everything from like from the hr department all the way down to how they make their own tables with their very own tables which i think is so rad um down to the race department so it's it's a really cool video i hope you guys stick around for that definitely first class operation it was a lot of fun hanging out with bill <clears throat> today and uh seeing how they do it you guys will check out that video but uh, we got bob willis from dynamax in the house we're gonna talk a little bit of mufflers Yep, and uh, what, next weekend, this coming weekend, is the San Felipe 250, so there's a whole bunch of guys down there that are pre-running, and it sounds like it's an absolute brutal track. It is. You know, our very own Lance Clifford is going to be racing with Roger Norman again in the uh, trophy truck, and they start third. And kind of the big news from San Felipe is this course is so brutal, it's blowing shocks apart. <laughs> And we've got a spy video right out of Geyser Brothers Trophy Truck Shop. They're down there uh, getting ready for the race. But Fox has got some new technology, and we've got a spy video. So let's go check that out. Hey, so top secret here. we got the new uh, Stealth Fox 4.3-inch four, 4 bypass with a... Uh, there's Fox right there. With the, whoa, what is that up there? Huh. That's some kind of cooler. Look at them hoses. Those look like something special. There you can get a better picture of the cooler. We haven't finished mounting yet, but we'll be on there tomorrow. <clears throat> this on Jesse Jones' truck for San Felipe. Go see if we can do some damage down there and uh, See what we can tear up, but you can see on the other side the hoses and stuff, how they're hooked on and everything, so. Well, there's a little uh, cell phone spy camera action right out of the Geyser Trophy Truck Shop and uh, getting ready for that. The neat thing about those shocks, this is next generation stuff. You guys are literally the first person to see that. And what they're doing is they're trying to cool these shocks because they're blowing apart. Of course, the whoops down there are so just, I mean, the shocks are overheating and blowing them up. Fox has come up with a new technology. Gonna try it out there for the first time. I think it's uh, pretty risky, but uh, we'll follow along next month. We'll have the results of that. But uh, right now we got Jason Shear in the house. Thanks for having me, you guys. Appreciate it. Well, welcome. welcome. Welcome back again, because you're just back in our uh, December episode, right? Yeah, we were talking about the Baja 1000. Well, now, now we're gonna King be of the Hammers. King of the Hammers, forget it. Well, you know, let's get right into it, Jay. It's, um, as you came across the finish line, I, I'll be honest with you, I was a little afraid to come up and congratulate you. Third place, I think anybody would be pretty proud of that. And, you know, we're proud of the effort. I know you were going for the win. Kind of a tough deal. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you put in all the effort and you have all the sponsors and team people that come down to help you out, all my friends work on this thing for, you know, two months before the race to try to help me. So anything other than a win is kind of like, you know, 
you're a loser. But, you know, it, it is what it is. And it really was, you know, a race with a lot of adversity. You know, after probably the first third of the race, we started having some issues and we were able to, you know, maintain it to the finish for a third place. So it wasn't a really a bad day considering everything that went on. It's just we didn't have any racing luck to start off. <laughs> Why don't we start right at the finish line, green flag drop, take us through the race. Actually, everything went great. Um, I got beat off the line by Gary Faravani. Which no, wait, was... wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you got like the biggest motor, the most horsepower of anybody out there. How'd you get beat off the line? I mean, come on now. I, I may have been a little late. I, I thought we were going on zero. He I jumped you, didn't he? Just, you can say it. Nah, he was, it. it was all good, but it was fun. We, we got in there. It was dusty this year. You know, we haven't had dust at King of the Hammers before. It's always either rain the night before or the week of. And so this was the first year that we had a real desert race for King of the Hammers. So um, that part was exciting. The race went really well for us. Um, even like the stuff that shouldn't wasn't good. You know, we cut a tire, um, you know, like probably 25 miles into the race, changed it in under two minutes. I'm like, oh, life's good. You know, we only got passed by one person during that and um, got back going. So. You know, the race was going really, really well, and then I made a mistake and rolled us over. And uh, how'd that happen? Uh, you know what? Because looking brother, at the pictures, it looked like it was like there's no way you should have rolled. I rolled over on flat ground. Rolled. Yeah. Now it was a mistake on my part, and uh, you know, I saw the people to the left. Even though my brother called out "go right," I thought, okay, yeah. And then last second, I turned it back and did it a little too quick. And I was in low range, so I couldn't run it out and just ran out of gear and dropped it down and. Luckily, the Warren Winch pulled it back over, so we, we, able, we were having a shot to get back up there. Um, Shannon had passed us, so we knew we had somebody to go, go fight for the win with, and that was kind of fun. So then it was on, um, and you know, you try to kind of protect the car and preserve it for the whole race so that you can make it, but once there's really like somebody in front of you that started behind you, you don't have a lot of choices. You got to go for it. So that was fun, you know, it was race on right then, and, and we were going as hard as we could, um, and then we just, you know, had a couple of, of random things go, you know, not really our way. When we when we checked out of the first main pit, we were in the overall lead, and that was pretty cool because that's the third year in a row we've left main pit in the overall lead. So kind of a fun thing to be able to say you did. Um, and then we made a strategic move thinking that, um, you know, the right thing to do is to winch back door. And I had been out there with uh, Jesse Haynes from Torchmate. So just, and, just make sure we're painting the yeah. right picture. Lap one's complete, you're starting lap two. First obstacle, you're up on back door. And we had our cameras on you, so you guys watching uh, our, our live coverage were following this, but ah, embarrassing. really we're, <laughs> we're starting lap two. Back door's the first obstacle. Things started getting a little bit sideways on you. Yeah, we had our winch cable came apart three times, basically. Um, we were using a strap that wasn't really a winch cable, but we thought it'd be faster, and it kept unraveling, and, and so it didn't work out for us. We were there for over 10 minutes trying to get up it, and we looked like buffoons out there, you know, so. Well, let, let's, why didn't you just drive up the waterfall? I know that's what you guys did in practice. What, yeah, uh, yeah, I was out there practicing with, like, Little Rich from We Rock and stuff, and, and we were making it one shot every time. When we pre-ran the next section, which is resolution, it was impassable. And we heard that they had stacked some rocks in there at the driver's meeting, but I didn't think it would be like a non-issue. I thought it was still gonna be really hard. So we figured, well, we know we're gonna winch resolution because it was not makeable by a vehicle. So we had the winch cable out. Why don't we just do both? It was like, okay, let's go for it. So when we had the lead, we thought that was the strategic thing to go do. And the safe play anyways. Sure. Yeah, and it just backfired on us, you know, and that was, when it wasn't meant to be, you know? So then we get to resolution. My brother was what? still out of the car. I, okay, I want to make sure we touched on this because this is definitely impromptu. I don't think this was in your, your no. race plan at all. <laughs> I mean, just, it it sounds mean, I'm just gonna ditch my brother for lap two, but that wasn't at all what we had planned to do. He was gonna run up and when we needed the winch for resolution, he was gonna hook it up and then get back in. Well, um, right there, Shannon passed us, got in front of us, we got to resolution. I drove right up it like it wasn't even there and decided the best thing to do would be to keep going. I mean, the guy ran, you know, a marathon last year in four hours and 20 minutes or something. I'm like, oh, he'll be fine. Well, he was so tired and winded from hooking the winch cable up three or four times that I left him pretty much. And so I waited at the top of res for three minutes for him. I finally saw his, you know, brightly painted helmet and he Seemed waved like an me eternity, on. I'm sure. Oh, just sitting there, just, you know, itching and um, hoping he was still coming. But I knew he wouldn't let me down. So, you know, and then he waves me on. I said, okay. So then we were, you know, it was Shannon and I, and it was kind of like, that's how it looked. You know, we had heard from our, on our radio, a lot of people got stuck in, in uh, outer limits. So, you know, really the race was coming down to just a couple of people that were, had gotten through that traffic jam. So, you know, I had one choice. It was a simple, simple choice. It was 
drive as hard as I can to get around Shannon and either gap him by the difference in what we started or you know push him till he broke and then or the worst case break myself so you know um, we had a blast we had an absolute blast it was like what you always want in a race is going back and forth through the desert um, through the rocks passing each other you know just making it a really epic thing and I, uh, that's probably something you'll remember or I'll remember when I'm you know, 70 years old, thinking about how fun this race was. Even though we didn't win, it was an excellent race. Well, that's so. kind of one of your lifestyle definitions is fun. Like, if you get into a race and you get super competitive, you get kind of unfocused, and if you're not having fun, you're losing You're losing what it's all about. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, all the work that goes into making this race happen for all the teams is, isn't really all that much fun. You know, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're wrenching on your rig every night, you're tired, you're, you know, spending money left and right to try to get all the parts you need to make it work. And then, you know, the race starts, the flag drops, and that's when you better enjoy it. Because if you don't enjoy it then, I mean, the thing's a waste. So, you know, that was, that was like the highlight right there. And, and, you know, then we had a bunch of issues, power steering belts and, you know, the rear end went out again. And so we drove the last 30 miles without a pinion in the rear, front wheel drive only, and, and limped it back. So, you know, all in all, it worked out really good that we even finished it all because it, it could have been, you know, sitting on the side of the trail until the, until the you know, last crew came through to help pull us back. But we cool. finished. Two questions. I'm going to put, kind of put them together. Going wheel to wheel with Shannon. You guys are passing back and forth for the lead and the dust. How much did the dust factor into that at that point or was it kind of cleared up? And really, when you're passing back and forth, what's going through your mind? I got to get in front of them, or I, I mean, what? I can't even. Yeah, really imagine. you know, actually, Shannon's really good strategically. Like he he knew when I got around him that the next section coming up was a high speed fire road, basically. So that if he could get me and his dust, he set the pace. So you know, he did that. He got back around me before one of the high speed sections. Excuse me, and then um, I tried to get back around him. What's crazy, like I said earlier, we've never really raced in the dust at King of the Hammers. And I've never really driven that car in bad dust. And what happened is the dust started packing up in the radiator. All that stuff I thought was going to work to keep rocks out and everything ended up turning into a big, you know, mud-filled pack in there. No air was going through the radiator. I finally got around Shannon. I guess it speeds around 120 or something, they said. Um, and you know, boom, I overheat. And I never really had the problem, especially in the winter down at the hammers, you know, overheating. So, you know, I had to lift. It was right before it was going to go into limp mode. And I knew if I, you know, pushed it into limp mode, I'd have to stop, let it cool off, turn off the ignition, turn it back on. So, you know, he got back around me. But that's, you know, that whole thing's going on. It's, it makes it one of the elements you got to play with. So, you know, that changes the way you race a little bit, but it was fun, so. so sounds kind of hectic, and you know, kind of the story you're telling, I know when the DVD comes out, the helicopter was following you guys, and we're gonna get to see this all in living color. Literally, you guys passing back and forth for the lead. Should be a pretty good DVD this year, but uh, yeah. right now, why don't we go over and take a look at your rig, and uh, you can walk us through just what it takes to go race and be competitive sure. at King of the Hammers. I don't know if I know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's start up at the front. Well, give, sure. give, give everybody a little bit of a tour of uh, what you got. Um, back in April of 2008, actually, uh, you guys came down with me. We built this at Shannon's shop, or sh I guess I should say Shannon, Nick, and Don built this thing at their shop in, in a week. Um, it was for ProMod, but we knew King of the Hammers was great, and we were going to be going out and doing that. So we started off with like the lightweight spider tracks, axles, um, and a lot of horsepower using an LS7, which I think was probably the first rock calling rig really to have an LS7 in it. Might be um, the only one still. I don't know yeah, any others. Well, I know a couple guys are starting with them now, the LSX blocks. But, you know, it was a dry sumped car. It was, you know, set up to run sustained high RPMs and stuff through the desert like we needed it to do. And a little bit beefier parts, you know. It, Turbo 400 wasn't really a common thing when we were building this. And I think even Shannon might have given me a hard time for running it at the time. But, you know, we basically turned a pro mod car into a, uh, a little bit of a wannabe desert car. And uh, Mike Schaefer helped with that a lot. And you, you actually took this car after uh, <laughs> Campbell's finished it. I think you went out and competed in a, a rock crawl with it, but then you took it to Schaefer's and literally cut it up and redid it for King of the Hammers. Yeah, you know, Todd from <clears throat> Fox and I, we had worked on some air shock stuff and uh, 
you know, I had even taken Lance down one time and we had gone and practiced and, you know, we couldn't really get it all to work the way we had it designed. So I went to Schaefer and, and worked with Fox and they basically set us up with the way they needed to get it to go. And it's great. I mean, the car is really easy to drive. Um, you know, it works pretty good at the high speed stuff in the desert now. Um, obviously, it's, you know, King of the Hammers desert. You're doing 60 to 80 and stuff. You're not really, you know, full desert racer guy out there, but it, it does its job back in the rocks well, pretty well. So. I have a feeling that when you're inside that cockpit and you're racing King of the Hammers, it feels every bit a trophy truck as you could ever imagine. <laughs> it's a lot rougher than a trophy truck. I wish it was nice and smooth like that, but you got to get your butt kicked at the end of the day in it. But. Here. Well, Jason, thanks for coming on the show. You know, we're going to sit down a little bit later and we'll do the round table with you and Tony, but uh, thanks for bringing your rig. And, uh, you know, I know Fox is one of your sponsors, and right now we're going to go to a Fox commercial. Uh -huh. You guys uh, hang with us. Check cool. this out. Thanks for having me. You know, rock crawling is, is really a unique discipline. Just the, the specific tire placement, application of throttle, it's kind of like playing chess, I think. You, you really have to think about where you're placing the vehicle, how you're lining up for the next set of gates. So, to me, it's a real thinking man's game. This race is really tough. You know, there's so many things going on in the car because you've got high-speed desert sections that are, you know, similar to a desert race. Uh, you get into the rock crawling sections and you really have to maintain a good speed and it takes a lot of control to be able to do it because if you go a little bit too fast just one rock will kick you over. This event, King of the Hammers, is one of a kind. It started out just being one race. Now they have a series, but it's hard to have, you know, the, a good car for everything. So everybody builds them in between. Some guys lean more towards the desert, and some guys lean more towards the rocks. I got something I think that's mediocre for both, and and drive it and deal with it. Suspension on the crawlers is, is very important. Everything's, it's got to be tuned, you know, and when we first started out, we didn't know nothing. And then we, you know, we hook up with the guys from Fox and they come out and show us a little bit about this stuff and we give them input on what we think and, and it all comes together. I mean, it, it's amazing the suspension that, that they're building for this stuff. You know, it's not just rock crawlers, it's desert cars, it's everything. back with the one and only Tony Pellegrino, Jen Wright. Thanks. Tony Pellegrino, now you took second place right behind Shannon Campbell um, by 30 minutes. Now when you're stuck on a, on a position where you're about 30 minutes, that's, that's all it was because a car's rolled over and an obstacle, what's that like? Do you just want to feel like you want to strangle somebody? Yeah. Or, you know I mean? like, it was really frustrating. You know, um, Shannon got by us uh, just before Outer Limits. There was two cars between us. Both of those cars clogged up the line on outer limits. One was upside down, the other guy was miserably stuck. Um, I told my co-driver to get out of the car, hook that guy up, let's just yank him out of the way. We pulled him, um, he ended up, you know, he was kind of teetery. He ended up rolling on our winch line so we couldn't even get away. So we flipped him all the way back over and we got some in-car uh, camera footage of this. He almost landed on the, to the front of our car. I backed up and backed into I don't remember who was behind me, but just boom, right into them, just so they cleared. We unhooked, we got that guy out of the way, and we just took off. Wow. And uh, we never really saw anybody behind us in the rearview mirror. We just were going as fast as we could. Um, obviously, you know, there was a few guys in front of us that we were trying to make up. But, you know, the cool part this year was when you went through the checkpoints, you could see what place you were in. So we, with the, with we the saw, stickers, yeah, right? we saw the number going down and we're like, yeah, this is great, man. We're making up time. And, you know, of course, like um, previous year, you know, you're, you're seeing guys off to the side, you know, good guys, guys that really know how to drive. They were having some bad luck with, you know, during the day. So um, we're just making our way, driving our race, just, you know, sticking with what we knew the car could do and uh, just pushing on. And, you know, by the end, it, it, it worked out pretty good. Tony. I think, you know, our viewers, 
would probably would have considered you a, an underdog for this race. I think you knew different in your heart because how much effort, and I know how much effort that you guys put into this. And n honestly, guys, there is nobody out there that does as much wheeling as this guy right here. I mean, 40 something weekends a year, yeah. you're out wheeling. Yeah. You guys just got back from TDS, went to Arizona to go wheeling, and then came to the show. Well, he, he pre ran some of the Parker course in the middle <laughs> of it. No, nobody, <laughs> nobody puts as much effort into this sport, into this hobby, and in really passionate than you do. So I think in your heart, you weren't the underdog, but everybody else probably considered you were coming into that. Did that help you kind of be an underdog where people were discounting you or not factoring you into it? Yeah, I, th I think I was definitely off the radar. Um, I know um, I was talking to Jeff Noel after the race and uh, he said that, you know, Shannon was coming in for the finish and they were running out of gas in the helicopter. So he had to go land and splash fuel. Mm -hmm. And he said, when they came back up, and the next car coming was me, he couldn't believe it. He was so stoked. He's like, Tony, man, he's coming in, this is great. Well, it was definitely exciting, at least for us down there calling the race, because you know we think of you as one of our own. You're, you know, you're very involved in pirate and in the sport, and so we're cheering you on the whole time. But I, I just got this sense that you were the underdog battling the, the names, and you were out there to prove something, and you guys just put on a hell of a race. I mean, I don't know if it went according to plan, but you guys, you guys had a great day out there. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not the traditional racer. I'm, I'm a Jeep guy. And, um, you know, we, coming into this race, we went out and we drove the car really hard. We, we broke tons and tons of stuff. That was in your plan, though, right? That was in the we plan. Talked, so yeah, that was, go, in, that was like your pre-running yeah. pre strategy, and then yeah. you kind of backed out of it as off, a race. Go, okay, we know where this stuff's going to live. You know, that's great. So when we went out race day, uh, my crew chief, Mike, you know, he was... He was like, just stay at our pace, just stay at our pace, you know? And how, how hard is that to stay at your pace? It's like, I could go faster, but I shouldn't right yeah, now? Yeah, you know, even when Shannon went by, it was, it, you know, he just went by and I'm going, man, I know the car can go that fast. So, you know, and then when we get to outer limits, you know, right. I'm kicking myself because two guys are in front of us, you know, that, that's the distance between us. Lap one, when you got, came in for lap one, where were you guys at? In, in the race position wise at the end of lap one? Uh, I don't know. We'd have to look on the stickers, the stickers, but um, it was pretty good. Okay. I mean, we were, you you're know, in the hunt. Yeah, definitely top 10. Which is um, good because you started 41. So right. you're so not too bad. Yeah. Um, but we saw those stickers going down like we were talking about, you know, lap one was, was pretty tough. It, the dust, like Jason was talking about was bad. I mean, bad. When we came across uh, Gibraltar, which is that far out point, um, we were going like 108, I think you and I were talking about, <laughs> and, and you, we were we were wait, right on the wait, edge of the dust. Wait, time out, you guys. Let's let's just put this into perspective. With these the rock crawlers that we all decided would be the fun going, to go desert racing, uh, going somewhere then, around 100 miles an hour, and if now not we're talking faster. Eight is so retarded to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome, and it's really cool that you guys are pushing the envelope that far. Yeah. I mean, that's real. Because these cars, they defy the laws of physics. I mean, the axles weigh more than the chassis. You know, it's just, yeah. it's no, not I, right. And I heard I, Jason before the show talking about how loose his car was, you know, for as fast as he was going. And, you know, I remember going that fast, and we were right on the edge of the dust. And I'm, you know, the car is You, you got to do loose. it for me. Give me the feeling. Yeah, show yeah. Me, the, the, the car feeling. is, you know, Jason, Jason it's, didn't do it's it. loose. You know, you're driving it <laughs> by the seat. And, uh, you know, there's times when you're going that fast where you don't even want to hit a pucker bush. I mean, it's, no. it's like that's just enough to upset the car and it's going to end bad. But um, we're going on, together, though. on the edge of the dust. And then the co-driver goes, turn right. And you just have to turn with all the faith into the dust. And you can't see anything. We're, we're talking about driving on GPS, you guys. And if you've ever looked at your GPS... You know, it's a little screen about this big, and there's a little pink line, and your co-driver's telling you, keep it, you know, a little left, a little right, and, and you're just blind. You're absolutely it's, in the dust, yeah. and you're playing a video game, yeah, and, and you're he, driving and by he's, GPS. He's going, go, 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 you know, and I'm, I'm like, dude, I can't see anything. What are you talking about? Go, go, go. And the, the dust clears, and we literally go through the two stakes on the course, and I'm like, no way. You know, we're right on track. So by that time, you know, as you turned, the, the breeze just took the dust a little bit differently. So then it was clear and we could, we knew this section of the course, we just really hammered it. We did a lot of pre-running um, before the race too. We did about 250 miles. I was just gonna ask you, yeah. how many miles? I know you spent a week down there, yeah. probably more. 
Yeah. 200 plus miles yeah, of pre-running? of pre-running. In this car? In this car, once we got the course, because, you know, a lot of guys will pre-run in something else. Um, I don't believe in that. I, I want to run in the car we're racing. I want to know how fast we can hit stuff. You know, if you drove it in a Jeep or something else or a UTV, feels, it, it would feel different. You know, it wouldn't different, be the same. Different, yeah. And what looks like a G out would be nothing in this thing. Normally, I wouldn't agree with that strategy, but hey, hard to argue with second place. It so, you know, it worked for you. But you had been done, you've been doing so much, not necessarily pre running, but testing in your car. You knew its limits, so you knew what it could and could not get away with, yeah. right? So, when you're out there pre running, you, you know where you need to, okay, it's time yeah. for me to back off, or you know what, this is the point where I can get yeah. it. Yeah. And you know, last year we did pretty good, 14th, you know, not too bad. It got us qualified for this year. Absolutely respectable. Um, and, and when we came after that race, I said, I want more power, I want better brakes and better steering. Those were the three things I wanted to fix. So this year we more, fixed all that. More power? More power, 200 more horsepower. More brakes? More okay. brakes. Important, because if you're gonna go fast, you gotta stop well, fast. Well, 42s, man, those things are hard to stop. <laughs> so more power, more brakes. Bigger brakes. What? And uh, better steering. Better steering. So we, Critical. you know, we already had house steering, but we went to their full trophy truck setup, which is much faster. So the faster you go, the quicker you Your need response. that twitch, yeah, to get back. Because if you think about like a motorcycle, that's one to one, man. You need to be fast. I'm gonna throw you for a little loop here. Let's get off the race for just a second because I know Genrite is the official suspension of King of the Hammers, and King of the Hammers is just growing. I mean, it's just blowing up. It's huge. It's worldwide. I mean, it's it's incredible, but. What does that mean for you, Genrite, as a business owner, to be the official suspension and bringing your product and showing the world what you got? Um, you know, basically, the, the suspension we've got on this car is very similar to what we have on a Jeep, but it's got the addition of the bypass shocks. So, literally, these are the same axles that are in my red Jeep, the same coilover shocks, just with that addition of the bypass. So we're just proving, and it's an ex accelerated proving. Ex accelerated. You know, big time. Because you're going through parts like crazy, so we really know what's gonna hold up, what the right setup is, what the right spring rate, what the right valving is. So, you know, for our customers that are ready to step up to that kind of a level, then we can really help those guys go right into well, it. It was a little bit of a setup question, because I, I know the answer, and you guys, what the answer is to me is the passion that's in this guy's heart in his soul and in his every fiber of his being. You're taking that, you're going racing, you're proving it and you're bringing it to your customers. And you know, it's a big part of Pirate. I mean, you guys are on there, you're doing it every day, but you're not just out there to pretend. I mean, this is your life it and it, it, it's just cool to see. You're one of those guys that I like to watch because you just absolutely love it. You know, and I, I love it. I don't it. know if you make any money or not, but I know you love no, it. No, I, I mean, I got 50 <laughs> bucks for second place. I mean, you know, that's nothing. Um, but, you know, the reality is I'm, I'm stoked to be out there with the Jason Shears and Shannon Campbells. I mean, you know, that's, it, it's, un, it's it unbelievable. Helps, it helps know? push your limits, too. A absolutely, absolutely. And these, you know, um, I was going to say, these guys keep me honest. You know, I really got to step up my game to they're, they're compete with them, you know. There is no fake in second no. place. You earned every bit of that. So, you know, you got to, I, I was thinking about this coming up here. You know, you, you've got to have some talent. You've got to have some good equipment. And you got to race smart. You, you've got to stay within your limits, within the vehicle's limits, you know, and, and you can upset that balance a little bit. You can have a lot of talent and, you know, maybe a decent car, you know, but you, you still got to have some balance within those three. Out of everything you just said, probably the hardest thing from my perspective is racing smart. Because one thing I know about racers, when they pull that helmet on, there's a little switch that sticks out the side of their head and it's a stupid switch. When the helmet comes on, it just flicks a stupid switch into dumb mode and you guys get a little nutty, but uh, it does, you know, you're, you're protected, you know, you, the, the volume levels cut down, you can't feel how fast you're going. I mean, literally I have my co-driver calling off every five miles an hour. Do you listen to your co-driver? Big time. Yeah. yeah that that guy boss. was a huge asset. Yeah. He's the boss. And uh, you know, he's, we're coming up on another car and he's like straight, 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 you know, go, go, go. And I'm thinking, dude, we, we can't see anything. We're going to end up rear-ending somebody. But, you know, he was pushing me into that stuff, and it, it, it all worked out. So, But wow. once we got through the first lap, you know, the dust got a lot better um, coming into the second lap. There's a bit of breeze that picked up, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of a breeze and uh, just less cars. You know, the attrition mm -hmm. was taking its toll on everybody and... You know? Well, we were down at Hammertown the whole time, so for us it was like at the beginning of the morning we we're like, oh, this is not good. Oh, but, good. but pretty much after like the the whole like when you guys started coming through that first lap, it was like, oh wow, we can start seeing things. Like we felt better even for our cameras because we had some that were just completely covered in dust. Yeah. But 
yeah, so. So I was going to tell you a funny story. When I came into the main pit at 60 miles, um, I couldn't keep my Parker pumper hose on and uh, because my camelback was in the way. So every time we moved, it would come unplugged. Well, in that heavy dust, you need that pumper. So um, I got into the pit, and I don't know if you remember last year, I kind of went ballistic <laughs> in one of the pits. <laughs> Well, this time, you know, Debbie's trying to pull that pack out of there and she was trying to put it back in for me. And I'm like, no, 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 get that thing out of here. So when, when the pit chief said go, I literally just got on it. And I guess the, everybody that was standing on the tarp, it just disappeared from underneath them as we took off. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of a funny moment for the team that everybody talks about. Like, oh man, there goes Tony, look out. I don't know that there's anybody as excitable and happy to be racing <laughs> Tony Pellegrino from Genride, but uh, why don't you and Jesse go over to the rig and give us a little walk around the sure. rig, show us sure. uh, yeah. just what it took to come in second. Absolutely. Now, obviously, you own and operate Genride. This is a proven suspension. You took second place. This is everything. But I think the coolest thing about this car is the fact that you didn't have any issues during the race. You didn't have any flats. You didn't have any mechanical issues. Like, obviously, there's something done right yeah. here. Well, again, that goes back to the practicing, pre-running, knowing where those limits are. Um, we, we really worked with uh, the Currys, Howe, you know, all these guys to really um, work, make everything work on the car. And, uh, you know, Goodyear, Curry, Howe, um, Advanced Adapters, you know, King Shocks, all these guys really pulled it together and worked with us. Um, I know for some of them it wasn't very easy, but they did a great job, and obviously, you know, that helped us get to the finish line. Right. Tony, I, I want to throw one thing out there. When I talked to you on the phone after King of the Hammer, I said, hey, bring the car in the state that it is after the race. Not just that. You went to TDS. You were wheeling TDS last weekend. Yep. After that, you went and pre-ran a little of the Parker 400, <laughs> and now you're back here, and you haven't turned a wrench on this thing yet. No, and these are still the same tires from race day, and... Um, you know, we've, we've been out there just having a good time. Um, we Over on Facebook, we posted some pictures where we were launching this thing, That's a, you know, like 15 feet in the air. So Pretty intense picture. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. The car works good. And, you know, even on a landing like that, it's like you land on pillows. It's just unbelievably soft. So um, this year, you know, we, we stayed with the 42-inch Goodyears. And um, hey, I think that, that worked out pretty good for us. Real quick on the Goodyears, and that was a big story of the race. Uh, Good year coming out and really, well, schooling everybody because not only you getting second, but of course Shannon winning overall. I'm looking at this tire. There's a pretty good chunk out of here. Is this the same tire you raced on right that, here? That is, but that happened in Parker. Okay, so, so that's not from no, King of the Hammers. The tires didn't even have a scratch on them after the race. They were no flats? Perfect. Nothing. Wow. Yeah, the basically, I, I just, it was the day I needed to. I drove a clean race and just stayed on the track and didn't get all squirrely and off in the weeds. Now, do you plan on racing, even though you already have a position for King of the Hammers next year, do you have, do you have plans for racing Ultra 4 for the rest of the season as yeah, well? Yeah, we'll do the Silver State, and we'll do a bunch of the other races. I don't know if we'll make it all the way back to Pennsylvania, of course. but we'll definitely do the other races for sure. All right, well, Tony, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Congratulations thank on you. this great success story. Thank I absolutely you. love it. Um, and um, thank you for paying our bills, because right now we're going to go to a Generate commercial. Oh, so Perfect. Enjoy. <laughs> Hey, how do you like that? Perfect timing. <laughs> Hi, Shannon. How's it going? <laughs> Just ducking in from the side. Obviously, a man that needs no introduction, Shannon Campbell, our two-time 2011 King of the Hammers. Here's our king. I wanted to be prom king. <laughs> <laughs> Did she even go to your prom? <laughs> they wouldn't let me. <laughs> Said it's too ugly. <laughs> Oh boy, now we're getting a little sideways. I don't remember that in the, the <laughs> practice session here. Shannon, has it sunk in yet that you are our two-time king? I mean, honestly. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I'm more worried about the next race right now, really. I, I know wins, sometimes you get lucky sometimes. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's just there. 
I try not to look at my wins. I try to look at what I can win. Okay, I know how modest you are and you don't like to boast about it, but I, I really do want to talk about this year's race and your achievement because, you know, going back to your first win, yeah, King of the Hammers was big and it was important, but this year, and we can all see how the sport's blown up and just become so competitive. And, you know, the guys that we just interviewed, it's not just three or four guys that can win it. There, there was, well, you tell me, how many guys were out there that you felt were competitive? Any of them guys could have won. Any of them. You know what I mean? It's, you know, Tony said that there's three variables. You got to have a little smart, some good equipment, and he forgot. A whole lot of luck. Oh, he definitely <laughs> forgot the fourth dimension, which might even be the most important is a whole lot of luck. Yeah. But I think everybody really wants to hear about your race. You know, I know we interviewed you after the race. We went over it a little bit. But let's start with the green flag drop-in and take us through the race. Uh, you know, we, we get to the start line, I think, before we started. JT started next to me. He's a good friend of mine, helps me desert race and stuff. And... And he says, hey, we're going to be trading pain or something like that. And I was like, no, let's don't do that. You know that. <laughs> and, uh, and you just so, smoked him off the line. Uh, I, I, think he, I think he let me go a little bit. I don't I, know. Uh, I know JT. He didn't let you go. Uh, I don't know. I think, you know, you get two tires together and it would have been a nightmare. But it, no. It could have got ugly. Start of the race, though, you guys started well back in the pack. Not certainly advan advantage where Number you guys 62, started. 62, yeah. I'll, I'll say disadvantage, green flag drops, a ton of dust. I mean, that had to factor in. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, when I left, I couldn't see nothing. I think it was the second turn around the mountain. I blew the turn last year, went out in the desert, and I'm back in trying to find my way back to the track. And then I get to mile marker one, got my first car at mile marker one. And uh, I'm not even sure who it was. I just had a path going. And, and then we get to the big hill. And there was a guy in the middle. There was two guys passing on this side, one on this side, and I went around all of them, headed up the hill and, and took off. And it just, everything was just a blur. You know, it was going and going and... and wait, wait a second, this, this blur. You know, we've been friends a long time, Shannon. You're a pretty mellow guy, definitely humble. But you put a helmet on and something changes because you're, you're, you're like, you're, you're a madman. I mean, you went, let's, let's be real. You went from 62nd position to the just after the end of lap one, you're out in the physical lead. I mean, you say a blur. Do you just like go into this like crazy psycho mode and, or what? Uh, no, I'm not psycho. <laughs> but when, it, when, I, when I know I got a pet, something to do, I mean, I know there's something there, but I don't know what it is and I'm not paying attention to it. So I, I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of really focused on what I do. So I don't. Super focused. And uh, I know there's an obstacle there, and I go around it, through it, on it, over it. What you know, I just I figure out a way to get through it without crashing. And does fear ever come into it? Oh, I'm scared the whole race. I mean, seriously. What are you, what are you, what are you scared of? Crashing. Crashing. Yeah, and I won't Because you're be able right to on finish. the edge, aren't you? I'm. Yeah, the you're, first. You're literally on the edge of out of control. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, you say you, you're beating yourself up the whole race. Yeah, and that's just till you get to where you feel like okay, I've picked off enough guys now okay, let's start backing it off a little bit and save the car, you know, now now let's get them a little easier. But at the first of that race, when you start that far back in the pack, outer limits I knew was going to be a nightmare if I didn't get through at least half of the field before I got to outer limits. So I knew that I had to do that before it became a traffic jam because once it gets so plugged up where you can't do nothing but just drive on cars, I mean, it's, it's not very fast driving over cars and... There's a whole lot of fighting that gets going on after the race, you know. So this year, luckily, it was a nonviolent race, and no one was mad at me when I got done. And when it, you got to outer limits, there was already a traffic jam. When I got to outer limits, it was crazy. There was there was like four cars. Uh, looked like uh, John Reynolds might have went to try and rear steer around some of them, and I think he was on his side. And and they're all following each other, and I'm like, boop. You know, there's a hole, there's a hole, you know, it's like playing chess at 100 mile an hour. You just, you know, you just start finding holes and, okay, I can fit there. Sometimes they're really scary and you do, you're like, oh, you know, I don't want to do that one again. <laughs> you know, you just, it's, it, it is, it's scary because you're like, you know, you got to go to the front, but you're, I mean. Any one of those could be a huge mistake. If exactly. You're and there. especially being by myself, if I had a lid it or something, you know, I. I'm getting fat and old, and I can't get out and winch my junk back over by myself. I mean, there's probably some guys that'd come over and help, but, you know. 
But you were saying that like if you get a flat, when, speaking yeah. of that, you, when you say if you get a flat, you just you just wait till you get to the next pit. You don't get out. Yeah, I, I feel that it's faster to drive it to the next pit, let them take care of it. Well, I mean, we're, we're kind of touching on a big story of the race, and that is you change tire uh, manufacturers right before the race, and that kind of leads into how you deal with flat. So, yeah, I mean. The way that I drive, I, I get into some stuff, and you know, you get where you don't, you can't pay attention to everything. And I drove into a couple of rocks, and just, I mean, it wasn't no, hey, I got a flat. It was, and blew it up. yeah, I blew it up, and I'm like, oh man. So then you go, you, you know, you shut down full mode, and you're like, okay, I got to keep the wheels on this thing, and not bend the wheel, and take a caliper out, and get further behind. So I get my first flat, and. I drove your, it. Your first flat, we were, we kind of left off at outer limits. Had you had the flat before outer limits, or it was it was right after I passed Shear, he was rolled over, and I got a little bit further, and knocked the tire out, and I and you're kicking yourself at that point. Yeah, I just passed Shear. Yeah, I know he's in the lead, but I passed Jason, yeah. and now I've, I I knocked a tire down. Yeah. So I get I get I get going. You know, I'm just like, okay, I just got to keep this thing moving, just keep focused, and. I get to the out the remote pit finally, and the guys get a tire on it, and I'm like, "All right, let's re you know calm down." And let's I rethink this. I, I, I take off there. again, and uh, I I get going, you know, and I'm thinking I've got a pretty good pace, and I, I don't know how far I got out of there. It wasn't too far, and I knocked out the other side. Same thing, just and I'm like, you know, you're you're just like. Mm. And you, so this, you had a lot of success with your four tire manufacturer. Any point during this race, you're questioning your decision to change? No, no. I, I Pure killed, driver errors. You, I killed you, as many killed BFGs them. as I've killed you know, right. these new. You know, it's okay. it's just driver error. You drive into stuff, and I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but I know no. I know our viewers want to know. You know, yeah. what's what's better? Is it the tire or is it the man driving it? And it sounds like you just drove it into a rock and flatted it. Yeah, I need to back <laughs> off a little bit, but you know, it's hard to do that and. Is that kind of your driving style? Like, if it's if it's there, you're just gonna drive over it and. Well, I mean, the stuff that gets you is just the little things on the sides, and you don't notice. You know, you slide in or something, and something would just poke it just right, and. So you, you do your best as far as watching out for your tires, but that's not. Yeah, I mean, I I try to baby everything, but it's sometimes it just don't happen that way. I'm not sure I really believe you, but we'll go with that for now. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyways, we get the tire tire on it and. I didn't get far out of that remote pit, and I knocked the other one out, and and now I'm like, oh man, I see the mile marker, and it was I had 20 miles to go to the main pit, and I get I get about five of them out of the way, and I'm just waiting for Jason to come, you know, I'm just like, where's Jason? Where's Jason? And finally, I see him in my mirror, and I'm like, oh, there, pull over, and he goes by, and. Wait a second, you actually pulled over and let Jason by? Well, yeah, I don't want to let him hit me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I don't sure think that I'm he would have. Sure. I mean, I was just putting along, but but so I let him by, and he takes off, and and uh, all I could think then is I've got to get this thing to main pit to get a tire on it. So I drove it as easy as I could through. I think we did the last two rock trails, and and uh, you know all the desert all the way back. And I want to interrupt just for a second. I want to highlight a point. You know, a lot of people make this assumption that you have this huge, you are one of the few professional racers in our sport, and that's pretty cool. And a lot of people think you've got this professional team, but the fact is. Oh, about the, the crew? About your crew. Tell oh, us about your no, crew the, my bit. crew, my crew is every friend I've got. You know, it's, I, I don't plan on taking any one of the hammers. I really don't have the money to haul everybody the hammers, even though I'd love to. If I had the money, I'd have sure. everyone in the United States here, you know, <laughs> but they're they're just everybody that all of my friends you know i've got of friends that show up and help out because they love it yeah the first year you know it was it was bondrant and and larry mccray all these guys out of california that we competed against forever and they're like hey you want us to help you and i was like sure you know and <laughs> so people come out of the woodwork where this year the arizona the undertakers from arizona some crazy guys you know and they're out there they they came to parker and pitted for me at parker they wanted to pit and i'm like Man, if you get that's great. If you guys want to come, I remember one of my guys. We got up at like five in the morning at Parker, and he gets up and he's these guys are still drunk. You know, he's like, "You guys better get out of here." And they're, I think they were gonna run them in the dirt. You know, and so they they're like, "We'll get out there. Don't you worry about it." So they get out to our pit, and 
So they pitted for me Parker and then they drove from Parker and went straight to the hammers. Well, I had to go home and change cars and clothes and and clean up stuff and change get, the suitcase in the race car and come yeah, out the king of the hammers. Get, I mean, load up a whole bunch of stuff because we were going to be but there. But the same guys that are just there because they love it, they like helping you out, yeah. and they're volunteering their time. And, that, and that's kind of the point I wanted to make because there's probably a little misconception about your guys' team and what no. you do. Yeah, because your race budget is a lot smaller than what people tend to think that it is. They think that you're just your budget is unlimited and you can go race whatever you want to race, whenever you want to race, but it's... You constantly saying you're broke. <laughs> I, I am, bro. I, I think mainly because I do too many things and I spread myself too thin. But I love getting in cars. I drive anything. I mean, that's my goal in life is just I just want to race everything and I want to win. I'm addicted to it. And Let's finish up the race. You're, um, Jason's rolled over. You passed him. So we get, yeah, he comes back up on me. You get a flat. He goes by and I'm. You know, the, when he passed me, I think I had about 15 miles to go to get back to Maine. And I'm like, oh, man. And I'm just kind of saving it, keeping it together. And, and I get to Maine Pit, and I'm, I'm just thinking, oh, man, he's gone. You know, because when he passed me, he was on a mission. He was moving. And uh, get to Maine, and my drive shaft's bent like crazy, so it was vibrating pretty bad. And, and the guys, they put a tire on it, and Nick started pulling the rear drive shaft. And I was like, Nick, are you sure, man? Are you sure it needs a drive shaft? Because I know it's going to take a while to change the drive shaft. And he's already got the front undone. And he looks at it and he's like, all right. He tightens it back up and he goes, all right, you're good. Get out of here. And get so I get, here. I get to back door and I'm like, oh, hallelujah. There's Jason, you know. I was like, <laughs> and I knew that there was him and uh, Faravani in front of me. And I guess Faravani never came out of the pit. I didn't know that. Yeah, he, had, he definitely had some trouble. Never <clears throat> did hear the story, but uh, had a great first half of the race. But yeah. Faded. So when I see Shear, I'm thinking, all right, Faravani's in front of him, and I pull up, you know, and and Mitch is on the radio. He goes, calm down, calm down, and I was just kind of, I'd been up that other side a couple of years ago, and I was like, oh, that's pretty hairy. So I backed up, and I waited, and, and then he's like, see if you can push Shear up there, and so I went to pull up and see if my bumper would line up with his bumper, and it wasn't going to happen, and so I backed off, and Waited till he got up. Give him a little hello tap, though. I'm sure. No, I never I did mean, tap him. I just no. see. To, I just looked to see if it'd line up and I could help him up it just to get the race moving. And and uh, so he finally gets his. You know, his brother gets his winch up and uh, gets out. And I was like, all right, we got one shot, and <laughs> went up it. And and when I pulled beside him, it was just like, see ya, man. I was like, I gotta go. If you guys watch the video of our live coverage, there's been this ongoing debate, IFS rigs versus straight axle, can the IFS rigs rock crawl? Right then and there, the question was answered, IF rig, IFS rigs, they're for real. You went up that thing as clean as anybody, definitely a rock crawler, ready to go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I ain't gonna brag about it. I, 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 I want to have the only one. <laughs> I'm gonna brag about it for you because it was in question. I think until that very moment right there when you made that pass in an IFS rig on the hardest obstacle in the race, and you just shot it, and boom, you were gone. No turning back. And really, from that point on, I looked at the stickers on your rig when you came in. It was yours at that point. Obviously, yeah. you had to get it home, but uh, yeah, it was a so, sixty second to out front. Yeah, so we get out the other side of resolution and i'm out there and i'm doing about 50 that's about where my drive shaft got pretty good and vibrate and my eyes were blurring and <laughs> and i'm thinking all right you know sheer still got to get up resolution he's got to load his co-driver i got time you know just take i did, in my mind it, he still had to pass me and get however far in front of me he started in front of me so i'm like okay i just take it easy and i'm out there chucking along and i look over they're sheer. <laughs> so, I mean, I was freaking out, and I, I lay it down, and uh, and the, he's on this road, and I'm on this road, and I just, I mean, it was killing me. To, I thought the dry shaft was going to fly out of it. It was so bad, and I get it in front of him, and I knew if I could just keep dirt on him that, I, you know, I could pr probably maintain position unless he just went really crazy and got around me. But So I held him off for a little bit longer, and we get on the double lane road, and I was jumping the lanes, man, just stirring dirt up on both sides so he couldn't get over there. And I, I mean, I felt bad, but I was like, man, I am, I'm no, covering yeah, the track, you know. You got to do what you got to do. Yeah, right I was there. like, I got a bent dry shaft, and I can only do about 75. <laughs> it gets real scary, you know. And, 
And, uh, Only 75. That's well, cool. I mean, it was, if you'd have been in it, you'd have been like, wow, this thing's really, I was waiting for it to take the side of the block out. And so I held him off for a little longer and then we get to the lake bed and the lake bed's two miles wide and I'm going 75, just holding my line. And I look in my mirror and I can see him just coming out of the dirt and, and he come out and just, I mean, passed me like I was parked. And I waited until he got by me and I'm just like, I couldn't take it no more. And I'm just like, whoosh, went through the dirt, went to the outside of my new, we got a 120 turn coming up. So I'm thinking he's going to be looking for me on the inside. So I'm going to go to the outside and he thinks I'm dead, you know, I'm limping it. And so we get to the outside and I'm just right in his roost and I see the road. He's lined up on the road and I knew I needed that road to keep, you know, to get him, to get him back behind me. And so I put it in the desert for a little bit and it was, it was scary. You know, I, my car's all out of shape and, and I jumped it in on him and did one of these, you know, throw a little more dirt and, and started trucking. And, uh, and then when we got to the next pit, I, I asked my guys, I said, where's he at, man? I, I can't run this thing too hard. And I knew we were getting into the rock sections where the dry shaft wasn't, you know, a real problem when we were moving slow, but they said, no, he's like three minutes behind you. And, and I was like, all right. So we go do the loop and come back to that remote pit. And they said, 15 minutes was the last radio contact I had with them and they hadn't seen him. So I, everybody's like, back it off, you know, just bring it home. And so I was like, all right. And then we got real close to the end and I, there was one more guy in front of me and I had to pass him. I went to go around him. I, I think it was Jesse Haynes and I rip around him and- Is he a lapper? He's gotta be a lapper. Probably. Right, yeah, he was. But at my that point, you're like, window net flew off right after, I mean, I didn't even get around him and the net falls off and damn it. And in XRA, they used to disqualify, disqualify you if you didn't right. have your window net up. And I mean, that something just made me, I pulled over, I jumped out. We, He's we, looking at me like, what in the hell is that dummy doing, you know? And We heard I, on the radio, Shannon, stop, Shannon, stop from the helicopter, and you were fixing your window net. No, yeah, no I had to pick problem. it up. I had to go, I went and picked it up, and I, I fought it for a little bit and couldn't get it back in. It just, it had dirt in it and stuff, and finally I put the top in and jumped back in and held it, and I just drove, finished, I came in it's easy, so couldn't believe it. <coughs> nothing but a thing, right? <laughs> yeah, I wish it was just you guys do that. <laughs> And you're the 2011 King of the Hammers. You know, I know for a fact that that story you just told right there is going to be on the DVD, King of the Hammers DVD from the helicopter, those passes. They're all on that DVD. Very exciting. I know Jesse and I and the rest of the crew calling the race. It was, you put on a hell of a show. Running around, running around Hammer Town, like, why, why is he stopped? What's going on? What's going on? We don't, we, because of course we didn't have all the communication, but it was, it was a very, very intense race. And even though you came in 30 minutes ahead, it was still amazing. Congratulations. 100% luck on that one. Hey, before we kick you out of here, I want to talk about the future just for a minute. And, uh, you know, you are our king of the hammers. Lauren Healy, you took the crown from him. He was a great ambassador of the sport, did a lot for land use. What can we expect to see out of you this year? Yeah, whatever anyone needs. I don't know. If, if they can steal me for a minute, I mean, I'm, more, I'm all about this land use stuff. And, I mean, I haven't done a whole lot of trail winning in a long time. I just took me and my kids this last weekend and went and did some really fun stuff and had a good time getting and back to the, the i miss it huh? yeah, yeah i mean they need to see it a little bit and i really don't have time for that but well speaking of time where are we going to see you racing this year well we got best in the desert series uh we rock series the koh series and we're adding pro light back into our series we're going to run the lucas series Going about halfway through the season yeah i'm gonna build another pro light and something i've always wanted to get back into and about halfway through the season this year we're going to we're gonna run Lucas. You know, there are a bunch of races in our backyard, and I'm gonna try and take on one more thing. That's well, a before, lot of seasons in one that, season. It's a lot yeah. of seasons. <laughs> Very well put. Hey, before we kick you out of here, who do you got to thank to making it happen? You know, all of my sponsors. I, and there's so many of them. I can't even remember. Norm, norm, normally, you wear the shirt that's got them all yeah. listed down, but I know everybody from Monster and you know, Curry. Monster, Dynamax, Goodyear, Curry, uh, How. And there's a Atlas. I'll put you on the spot. Advanced I, I mean, yeah, it's everybody knows who my sponsors are. If you don't know who they are, you better <laughs> learn because they got the best stuff, you know. Well, so. but, well, I know one of your sponsors, Dynamax. We got a Dynamax commercial. Let's go to that right now. And uh, hey, you guys, send in those questions for Jason and Tony and Shannon. We'll be taking viewer questions here when we do our roundtable. Send them in. We'll ask them what you want to know. 
right now we're going to go to Dynamax commercial. Dynomax VT, the world's only performance muffler for drone-free, high-flow horsepower. The Dynomax VT muffler delivers the performance you demand without irritating drone inside your car, truck, SUV, or Jeep. Here's why the VT muffler is the most advanced exhaust technology in the performance market. Longer life, increased strength, and classic looks. Maximum durability on any vehicle. Faster, easier installation. Dynomax's advanced direct flow path for maximum horsepower. Sophisticated engineering features that create the throaty, true performance sound you prefer. A relentless attention to detail that ensures head-turning performance. But here's the secret to the VT muffler's most important benefit, our patent-pending sound tuning valve. Now you can eliminate that unwanted drone while increasing exhaust flow and horsepower. This precisely calibrated high strength internal valve provides maximum performance by opening within critical RPM ranges. Then, during periods of consistent throttle, the valve tunes your flow for drone free performance. The VT muffler provides a deep and powerful sound when you want heads to turn and filters out unwanted resonance when you're cruising the highway. There's simply nothing like it anywhere else. Gain maximum performance. Eliminate head-ringing drone. And it's guaranteed. The revolutionary VT drone-free muffler is here only from Dynomax.